we're going to be taking a little bit of a ride on this one. It's not just some of your ancient records that are telling you that batteries of extremely strange things. You know, the body, the human body is almost like a biological spacesuit, but the batteries of strange things have occurred on this planet. This is the Enuma Elish right here. It's certainly talking a lot of demonic things from another realm all the way back to the very beginning. Ah, look at the hit on that thing. And not only that, there's been a lot of sacrifice. In fact, child sacrifice. Something about the blood, particularly the blood of the innocent or the drinking of the blood, goes all the way back to the altars of Baal, Tammuz, Pan, Enkidu. Now, Pan is the little goat god with the horns on his head. You find that strange? I'm sitting here looking at the Enuma Elish. It's almost, you know, it's almost like a dimensional thing that operates from some other realm right through the mind that they're describing in many instances. Like it wants to birth some kind of a, I don't know, like a, like a race inside of a, uh, inside of a race. That's DNA right there. The software of life. What's fascinating is whatever these things are, I've been talking about doing that since the very beginning. All right, I'm going to read to you the text of the Enuma Elise right here. The Enuma Elise, the wisest of the wise, the sage of gods, Bel, that's Baal, was conceived in Absu. Absu was Marduk, the god Marduk. Marduk born. This right here on the screen, this is Marduk. And Bel, Bel, Baal, Belzebub, means Lord. Here's Marduk again, but in the stream of Marduk, this bloodline dropping down from Ham, Cush, Nimrod. Of course, Nimrod had a very wicked son named Mardun. Maybe that's Marduk. But this bloodline right here. And what a cult story would be complete without our ancient Madonnas, our sirens, our screech owls like Ishtar with the two owls on the side right here. Or Inanna, the first Madonna of all earth, hailing forth the first Antichrist, which of course would be Nimrod. And she's holding captive by the nose a lion right there. Or the serpent spiraling its way up, the ancient legend of Lilith. But in these stones, the Enuma Elish, at the very top is the Tiamat, the serpent, from which we find a lot of alien-looking characters. In fact, she states she birthed the monsters and the demons. On tablet three of the Enuma Elish, we have the Tiamat, who is the serpent god, the creator serpent goddess. At the very top, the mother goddess is the serpent god. Beneath her, Anshar, the great grandson to the great serpent god. In fact, right here on tablet three, and Anshar opened his mouth and unto Gaga. Wow, are these names sounding familiar? Unto Gaga, his minister or ministress, he spake the word, O Gaga. Thou minister that rejoiceth my spirit, almost tickling the soft spot, goo goo gaga on the belly of the snake. Let me welcome you to part two of the, the Genesis, the God in a Nutshell Genesis set. These really, these really are awfully strange, elongated heads, aren't they? They really are sort of alien looking. Now on the Enuma Elish, where the serpent is the creator god, this is one of the oldest creation accounts, occult creation accounts in the world. It says here, with poison instead of blood, she, the serpent, filled their bodies. Fierce monsters, she clothed them with terror. With poison, instead of blood, she filled their bodies. Does that sound familiar? 
This comes from the Holy Basilica right here. Of course, Basilica Basilisk. Now that's a serpent, like a crowned serpent, isn't it? And serpents, they lay, they lay eggs. These come from ritual temples, giant ritual temples, where they would do human sacrifice, human sacrifice. You know, I had a friend tell me a strange thing one time. He told me his belief that pre-flood items, pre-flood artifacts, many still around today that nobody knows about, were the most valuable artifacts on earth, kind of artifacts kept in the palaces of kings. That being said, it does sort of make one wonder if those garments from the Garden of God, if maybe those are still around even to this very day. This is the part two of the Genesis study. The last section was garments from the Garden of God. This is gonna be a full presentation, a full documentary film, uh, just for YouTube, Facebook, wherever you may be watching this. Over at GodInANutshell.com, not only do we have, uh, and I appreciate every one of you that gets copies of the God in a Nutshell books. You're, you're not only helping support us, but they do look absolutely stunning on a coffee table. They're fully illustrated. It's a series, a set of three books. The full version of Garments from the Garden of God is available for immediate streaming. We also have Entities Part 1 and Part 2, both full-length documentaries. If you have not seen the full-length, you need to watch the full-length of Entities, actually both of them. They're, even if you've watched them before, watch them again. That's a heck of a ride. And a special thanks to the members of the Roosevelt family who are here, and the one who is not, Eleanor. That's a real demon face with shifty eyes looking into a camera right there. The face should not be there. Because as all of you famously learned when I served as president, my wife, now the Secretary of State, was known to commune with Eleanor on a regular basis. And so she called me last night on her way home from Peru to remind me to say that, that Eleanor had talked to her and reminded her that I should say that. Manu, are you there? Now, I'm just gonna lay this out there. Eleanor Roosevelt actually died in 1962. But here's the good news. I'm glad to hear that she's still periodically making it down to Peru. And more than that, coincidentally, that's where heads like these come from. I think you're gonna, you are going to, you're gonna love the way this thing ends. And taking that just, just a pinch, just a pinch further, we also have a film called Tablets of Destiny up there. And I wanna talk about these weird heads. I wanna thank every single one of you that have supported us in any possible way. We thank you for that. The stuff does sort of look cool, doesn't it? All right, let's do this. Let's get into the film. Now, speaking of ancient garments, and I'm not a fashion guy. I mean, normally I'm not. But look at our ancient Nana, our ancient Madonna here. Boy, she's striking a pose and probably getting to it. Now, that right there, that's not just a high heel. That right there looks like a Hollywood Boulevard pretty woman boot all day long. She could strut the block of any ancient temple. Over here we have Ishtar. Now Ishtar, the queen of heaven, and she's interchangeable with Inanna. Inanna, by the way, is the, both the lover and also the mother of Tammuz, the strange biological creature, the goat man depicted in your Text. Anyhow, I'm going to lay that in your hands for this moment. You don't have to think about it too hard. Tammuz is recognized on the Hebrew religious calendar. Tammuz is recognized as the month. It's a month on the Hebrew religious calendar. As the month that they worshipped, the, that they abandoned God, the Ten Commandments were smashed, and that they worshipped the golden cow. Remember the symbolism, golden cow. This is Ishtar, the later version of Inanna, who would also become the moon goddess 
Asheroth or Astorte, which is of course where you get Easter from. Like this giant painted egg from Africa right here in my hand. Easter, they would paint the eggs. Only around the temples they would dip the eggs in the blood of the sacrificed humans, sacrificed children. Now Astarte with the two little owls here would come down in her bird's wing. She would come down in her in her egg and she would do this once a year and be reborn. Her Easter egg. Now it could actually get you thinking what kind of creatures lay eggs? Well birds, birds lay eggs, there's a bird there and of course fish, the fish-headed Apkelu back here. Well fish can lay eggs and of course well, reptiles and uh, snakes can lay eggs. And these are all ancient, well, they're, they're love, sex, magic goddesses. And don't get them wrong. They'll, they'll, they'll kill you. They'll kill you at the temple in a heartbeat like that. But I was thinking of the concept of the uh, Aliens movies. Now, what was the idea behind that? You kind of had these biological, yet otherworldly, yet demonic kind of characters and they had eggs and the eggs had sort of a sort of a male organ or a sex organ on them it would attach the face and to birth itself to birth its own race these demonic things it sort of needed the human race to birth its race within a race and of course with easter you well the rabbits don't lay eggs um, they breed like rabbits. So whatever this is being represented, births quick after it lays its eggs. Man, where did we get all of this strange symbolism from? Well, what I know is this. In just the case of Easter, on one end, you've got the pagan beliefs. And by the way, I like an Easter egg as much as anybody. And on the other hand, you're celebrating the death and resurrection. I think somehow got amalgamated into one the pagan beliefs and the resurrection of Jesus like two trees and this happened at the Council of Nicaea where they got amalgamated together in 325 AD and that's the Vatican there and they're just wearing all these strange hats that look like fish heads they're called mitre hats look very similar the priests and sages of ancient Samaria Assyria with the fish head there. Fish lays the eggs. Got to amalgamate things. Got to make everybody happy. The Christians and the pagans. All in one. When we talk about concepts, artwork, and ideas, they're generally based on some semblance of reality. Perhaps even reality from the ancient world. And you're alien otherworldly stuff if you will even describe sort of on these rocks well I mean if you've got something that just appears and disappears I guess the question will always become the first question in fact where was it when you don't see it and of course if we're speaking about aliens with well, this guy right here in fact this is one of the first drawings in the world of what we today call a gray alien this came from Alice one of Aleister Crowley on the top of cultists in the world well, this right here is Aleister Crowley's spirit guide on the screen behind me. And right over here, this is the, the witch, Elias Levy, summonsing what they call a wisdom spirit, an ancient Yoda. But do all of these things have something in common? And do they lead us backwards? to an ancient serpent, a seed of a serpent. Here's the Greek goddess Nike back here. You know what I noticed about her? Poor girl, she's, she's missing her shoes. What other worldly spirit are they bowing to? And how do they come to that conclusion? To bow to that on the walls of Egypt. And why does it always have to do with genetics? To take something and make it into something else.
And with all these ancient Madonnas and goddesses here, it just wouldn't be complete without a sprinkle, just at least a little bit, just a little sprinkle, a little bit of uh, Gaga running loose up in there. Kick back and enjoy the film. You're coming on a, an unusual ride. Beneath Anshar is Anu, the sky god, son of Anshar. And of course, from Anu, we have the whole body of the Anunnaki, the Titans, the Titan sons of Anu, or the biblical sons of Anak. Now, do you find it strange that I find all of that, even probably the most popular themes from music, rock and roll, Aliens, and even blockbuster movies. And this set of seven ancient stones. You find anything weird about that? And we're also going to hear the lean arc in this, because when you talk about the days of Noah, so it was in the days of Noah, you're talking about the time period a little before and a little after the flood. Enoch 19, and Uriel said to me, here shall stand the angels who have connected themselves to the women and their spirits, pay attention to this, assuming many different forms are defiling mankind. That means even to this day. Any of you rock and roll boys or rap guys run into uh, any ancient sirens, sort of spiritual ancient sirens? <laughs> Who knew it might have happened to you fellas? It's easier to let them in than to get them out, isn't it? Don't worry, I got you on this one. And by the way, for the rest of you, I'm not joking about that. There's a lot of little spookies, boo, running around this place. And shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as gods. Anybody sacrificing this day to demons as gods? Let's keep going. Here they shall stand to the day of the great judgment. God's been talking about this since the beginning of the book. Where they shall be judged and made an end of. And the women also of the angels who went astray became as sirens. I bet some of you know what that passage is talking about that are watching this video. And I, Enoch, alone saw the vision and the end of all things and no man shall see as I have seen. It's going to be a heck of a film guys. We'll get there. That spins us right back around through Ham, Cush, Nimrod and of course the wicked son of Nimrod, Mardon or Marduk if you like. That's Nimrod, Nimrod down here. That's his wicked son was Marduk born. Now, Marduk, seen at the top up here, here's his depiction, how he's commonly seen. This one of the largest gods in all of Babylon. Now, we'll make it full circle and bring some, perhaps, illumination to characters like Tammuz in our text, where I'd like to draw your attention to, at least for this part of the video. It's right up here in Yasher 11. It states in verse 7, Notwithstanding this, Nimrod did not return to the Lord. That's a real common statement about Nimrod. And he continued in wickedness and teaching wickedness to the sons of men. And Mardan, his son, Nimrod's son, was worse than his father. And he continued to add to the abominations of his father. Verse 8. And he caused the sons of men to sin. Therefore it is said, from the wicked, that's Nimrod, goeth forth wickedness. That is Mardan. Hopping from Yasher over to the stones of the Enuma Elish where we find Marduk, the now deified Marduk. Deified means it's an actual person, but they're being personified, in fact, on stone now is a god. Well, the god Marduk is now teaching mankind on stone a creation account of the world beginning with a snake. Well, the playboy of the empire, Marduk, he's always got his little dragon dinosaur with him. Mushu, the legendary dragon pet of the god Marduk. Now, Marduk not only kept dinosaurs as pets, and he wanted you to know that. Now you find dinosaur drawings pretty well all around the globe, from cave art to, well, these right here. 
This cylinder seal comes from Uric. To put that in perspective, Uric is right here, right next to Ur, Nineveh, Babylon, just down from where the boat that saved all mankind landed. In fact, Uric is one of the cities claimed to have been built by Nimrod. Tower of Babel, or ancient Eridu, the Ziggurat of Eridu, is right there. Whatever the case, in ancient Uruk, you have cylinder seals with dinosaurs. Now, it's awfully hard for a guy to brag that he's got pet dinosaurs or pet dragons if he's never seen one. It's also hard to draw one if you've never seen one. But it's even harder to brag that you've got one if no such thing exists. People that answers in Genesis certainly feel that way. I think that's a, a baby brontosaurus right there. Here's our, my little guy down here. See, he's a baby one. He's a long neck baby one down there. And he's got his little food bucket there, which has come in through this chute. This chute right here has delivered his food down into his trough. These are all very simple little workouts. And he's got his water on the other side. Dragon imagery is not only fairly prevalent following the flood, but there's only a small handful of what we actually call dinosaurs. Of all the creatures that Noah brought, not just in Genesis, but also in the book of Yasher, you can be relatively certain that, well, it's actually covered in the text, that Noah was definitely smart enough to bring the baby ones. Here behind me on the screen, this is called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge right here. and It encircles the earth like the seam on a baseball. And it's actually what divides up your continents. There's still hot searing water coming out from those vents, even to this very day. And the day that broke forth, this would throw mud and sludge all around the entire Earth globally, just like we see the layers of strata globally that are underneath the ground, which are sorted by weights and densities, and the animals trapped entire herds, graveyards of animals trapped inside of that strata are sorted by ecological systems. On the subject of strata, Lugalbanda and animals buried underneath the ground. Lugalbanda, and we're gonna learn that this, on these rocks right here, that Nimrod, Lugalbanda is Nimrod, or in Merker's top guy. Lugalbanda is Shardlamer in your biblical text. We will get to all of that. But Lugalbanda is telling us that he had an ensued bird egg. That's what he's telling us on these very stones right here. And that his ensued bird is a giant bird that could pick up cattle or even men for him. And that he believed he could communicate with it. It was an occultic type bird. But he's literally writing to you about an Anzu bird, just like fossils of giant animals that we find underneath the ground. This behind me, for example, is a giant bald eagle's head, a pre-flood bald eagle's head. You need a Garden of Eden style world for these creatures to even, many of them couldn't even breathe today. Here's a modern bald eagle's head. Here's an ancient bald eagle's head. And that's not to mention the fact, and I bet they didn't tell you this in the university, that's a modern penguin's head. That behind it on the screen, that it, these penguins were nearly seven feet tall, and you excavate them, in this case out of the Peruvian desert, that penguin would be taller than most basketball players, and beyond that would weigh about 250 pounds. Just think of the gravity of that penguin. And you're finding records of dragons all over the place. This behind me is called the death pose. It's so common it has a name for it. The reason the animal's head is bent backwards like that is because it's gasping for breath while it's dying and being buried underneath the ground in graveyards. But 90%, in fact, I'm not even being honest with you on that. It's probably more like 95, 96% of everything you find in that fossil record underneath the ground. And by the way, all these giant animals would have to be immune to evolution because they're not getting better over going from little bitty things to great big things. It's the reverse of that. You've got giant, big, bad, bold stuff turning into little bitty, rinky, dinky stuff. And all throughout that fossil record, most of it, let's call it 95%, just for the sake of arguments, probably more than that, is marine life. Seashells and clams, seashells and clams. And these guys here, little floor crawlers, they clean the bottom of the ocean pre-flood world. And when you talk about following that fossil record, you're finding weird stuff. No matter what anybody argues that it is, it's weird. 
and it's all over the place. Weird stuff. This one is a genuine, for reasons I'll go into later, it appears that people with head binding, like this one here, were trying to copy things like this one here. And they were doing this all over the place, following the flood, while talking about dragons, like this thing here were buried, drowning alive, all over the place, globally. But they're definitely telling you about dragons. Giant birds, giant animals, and things that can't even exist anymore. So rolling back into our fossil record, full of marine life and drowned dragons, Today, in universities, they often compare the strata underneath the earth to tree rings. I would like to point out to all of the universities in the geological community that this right down underneath the ground, this strata, these aren't tree rings. That's actually dirt. In fact, the word strata means sedimentary rock laid down by water. But no matter the case, Noah was definitely smart enough to take the, the baby animals. We have no idea how power packed the genetics was before that flood, but we can see the evidence of what that was before the flood. And animals tend to speciate, which is different than evolve. For example, you have this instinctive knowledge that a originating set of dogs could never evolve into sea turtles or whales or rhinoceroses or become pine trees. But you do know, even as a child, that one set of dogs could breed, particularly if it had really power packed genetics, could breed into a lot of breeds of dogs. And in fact, everything on this planet is declining over time. It's not improving over time, it's declining over time. Everything from the cells in your skin to the stars in the heaven above, which is exactly the reverse of evolution. And also, I'd like to just take one second to point out that uh, while many in the university communities and the science communities have been awfully critical and insulting to those who believe that this place has any kind of a spiritual origin. And I would argue that many of those universities have mocked not just the Bible, sometimes very vulgarly, <laughs> as well as most any other ancient text that they didn't like, but have done an enormous disservice to the very conscious and dimensional nature of this place described in those pages, or the absolute butchering of genetics. And the Bible is actually the book of genes is, and is telling you about complete, not just single strands of DNA, but the requirement of entire body plans for every cell, every organ, every symbiotic system, all coming together to create a biological majesty, literally birthed into this place from scratch and consciously plugged in as if by Wi-Fi. And by the way, what is consciousness? What is a thought, an idea, a continuous live stream that's allowing you to call all of the top shots on the whole biological spacesuit? How does the intangible control the tangible? Those texts are telling you that you are not only living in a subset of a much larger and far more complex reality. But more than that, that you are already seated somewhere else. You are already seated in heavenly places. What does that passage mean? But no matter the case, you are calling the top shots on the whole machine. Now you don't get to pick it from the start, but you do get to decide what you're gonna do with it. In short, you are the ghost in the machine. You're running the whole puppet show of that whole biological spacesuit while they're pitching monkey men. So I would come back to that while some, myself certainly included, have taken those pages very seriously. In fact, on occasions, letter by letter, as it almost reads like a science language in those ancient texts. The universities have viciously mocked they're smarter 
they're smarter back there, you see. And they've also pretty well mocked and ridiculed pretty much all of our ancient historical records to the absolute hilt. I do want to remind you clearly, and not in any kind of uh, mean way, that you guys are pitching this. And I'm, in no part of me am I upset about it. In fact, the contrary, many of you that are top speakers may find that from God in a nutshell, we're now sending you birthday cards, greeting cards, Christmas cards. We're actually thankful. And I will never on any personal level. If you guys come to me, which many of you have, and argue to the hilt that your very strong belief, your very strong belief that you come from ancient monkeys breeding, I will never personally argue with you on that. In fact, I might even keep that on the low, fellas. Many of you believe that you come from monkeys breeding at the top of the universities be very honest with you. I find it very difficult to believe that that's not true. So we thank you, the God in the nutshell, for believing that and continuing to believe that. Please do. But that boat, Noah's Ark, which is actually mesmerizing when you look at the scale of it, that boat is the size of a modern day super tanker. And it's really also designed to just float up and come back down and protect the things on board. And behind me, through all of these cages on the screen back here, is a recreation of the mesmerizing scope of that boat. And up above these walkways that go here and here and all the way down to the end and all the way to the other end are where they drop in the food that goes all the way into the troughs. For this animal, that animal, and every animal going all the way down to the end. And here's the truth about that mammoth boat behind me. The mathematics for it certainly work. In fact, modern engineers call the design of that boat the most optimal for exactly the job that that boat would have to do. A special thanks to Answers in Genesis. Their Noah's Ark exhibit is absolutely mesmerizing. A very special thanks also to Israel, which is where some of the footage in this film is from with me right now we're in Israel and I'm on the border of three countries so you've got Syria you have Lebanon and you have Israel these three countries come together right at this mountain behind this enormous cave here Mount Hermon where the events of Genesis 6 as well as Enoch 6 took place and that's Pan's cave right there at the base of it with Pan sitting at the side is right at the base of Mount Hermon seen in the imagery right there atop which Stella was found giving honor to the fallen angels that had made entrance right there at the base of that mountain. Right down from our Enoch here right in the base of that hole where they would do those sacrifices. This is where the elites of the Greeks and the Romans, the aristocrats, would gather in secret or in private in that day to worship. And more than worship, there's always something historically in history, in all of these empires, about the sacrifice. This is the famous Pan's Cave this was an ancient temple where children were sacrificed at the mouth of this cave behind me. The cave almost looks like a devil's mouth back there. Strange, isn't it? Historically speaking, that's what they'd want to get together and do, isn't it? So, and it's also right there, the base of that mountain, where Jesus pointed at Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Well, it's at the base of Mount Hermon where Jesus transfigured before the disciples. He was literally firing a shot at darkness and stating, okay, now it's time to begin. Special thanks also for some of this research here about the Stella on Mount Hermon goes to my friend, Skywatch TV, Derek Gilbert. And Pan from Pan's Cave, that's Pan right there with his little flute and he's there to take the children and to deceive them and to enchant them and take them and drown them. Pan is of course based on, well, Gilgamesh's friend, Inkadu, seen right here in artwork in an ancient statue 
This comes from just outside of Pompeii, a city that was destroyed. There was, these were the kind of statues that they found underneath the volcanic ash of a city destroyed by a volcano in 79 AD. And that's Pan right there ravishing a goat. I guess when Gilgamesh had first met Enkidu, he was, well, he was ravaging the temple prostitutes or probably whatever he could get his hands on. Enkidu means Enki created. We're gonna learn some more about Enki. But there is in fact an altar in there for the children at the base of Mount Hermon inside of Pan's cave. And ancient Baal, seen right here with the ayin in the center of the word in Hebrew, demanded that they come and they bring their children. That's what Baal demands. So I guess we know the, the spirit behind that, correct? Jesus said when he was surrounded with children, he said, anyone that would hurt one of these, the little children, it would be better for him in that day if he were never born. It would be better that a millstone, a millstone is an enormous stone. A millstone, and this is a millstone on the screen right here, this rock going around in the circles. These were used to, they were used to crush grains but in Israel, which is where this one is from, the, the millstone would also be used to make olive, or to crush olives into olive oil. That a millstone be tied around his neck and he'd be cast into the sea, the abyss, the abuso. Here is the scope of the size of this thing on the screen behind me, Noah's Ark. Even if you're an atheist, you have got to go visit it. And most people wouldn't think it but when you actually look at the different animals you need, and remember most of the animals on this planet are sea life, fish, <laughs> clams, bacteria, amphibians. You don't really need a lot of those for the boat. Here's the bottom line, is that when you actually look at what you need on that boat and do the math for it, Noah's Ark is actually way overkill for the job that it needs to do. And that actually plays a role in the story we're gonna tell and walk through in this video. So it says that the boat landed on the 17th day of Nisan. That's the same date that Jesus walked out of the tomb. It was on the 17th of Nisan. Calendar dates are very important to God and also numbers. In fact, he's got an entire book called Numbers. And also symbols. God has symbols and the occult has symbols. Choose this day who you serve. But Nisan 17, 7 and 1 of course is 8, that's the number of new beginnings. On Nisan 17th, and that's the date on the Hebrew calendar, that's when the ark, God goes out of his way to tell you that the ark hit ground on Nisan 17. The day they walked through the Red Sea, that the Red Sea parted, and they went through the waters of the Red Sea. They passed through the abyss or death to the other side of death. It was on the Psalm 17. And the day Jesus came out of the tomb, the new beginning, was also on the Psalm 17. And this canal here that you're looking at, I want you to look down this thing. I'm going to walk you along it. This is where the stone was that was rolled away right through this canal where I'm standing. And as I turn you back around and you can see this puppy, how it went both ways. And what you would do is you would have Roman seals. So when the, the large stone, and they found the stone by the way, but the large rolling stone, when it gets put in place, will block this entrance here. Those three things I wonder if that's a coincidence. And the stone that goes right here on this pathway, on both sides of it, you can see where the stone was. This is where the stone was that was rolled away. And I'm going to walk you, we're just going to walk inside, we're going to walk right inside this. I'm going to set my camera back down for you. But we're going to walk right inside the tomb of Jesus Christ. 
these three things here. So the resurrection of Jesus happened on Nisan 17, of course, 7 and 1, of course, that's 8, a new beginning. These are all new beginnings. Well, eight people on Noah's Ark. This is, the, this is the actual tomb. These are the rock walls of the tomb of Jesus. That's what this is that I'm standing inside of. This is where, this right here in front of you, this is where the stone was that was rolled away. But on the Psalm 17th, that's when Jesus came out of the tomb. So three days before that, just like the three crosses, became as a man. God himself became as a man and laid right over here. Right over here in this area where this little fence guy is. Where you see, this would have been pitch dark in here, in this room, for three days. Jesus was... 33 years old when he was crucified and came out of that tomb. Is that correct? And there I saw one who had a head of days and his head was like white wool. This is God we're talking about. And with him was another, the same mother that was in this room and walked through this door who had the appearance of a man. Now, if the day that Jesus came out of that tomb was Nisan 17th on the Hebrew calendar, the Hebrew religious calendar, well then, Nisan 14th would be three days before that. The Passover, as if a symbol, a foreshadowing for nearly 1,500 years they did Passover before the crucifixion of Jesus. And his face was full of grace, like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me, there was an angel standing here at this door. When the women came to the tomb in the morning, there was an angel standing by this door. Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? His face was full of grace, Jesus, who laid here for three days. Like a symbol, the sacrifice of the, of the lamb. But that practice of the Passover, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, well, that began in ancient Egypt. Well, the first Hebrew Passover, well, that was the last plague that happened in Egypt. They had, to, they had the Passover, gets its name from the angel of death. On that particular night, that Passover was going to pass over the houses of the Hebrews. So they had to sacrifice the Passover lamb and put the blood on their doorposts. Those that had put the blood of the lamb as the covering the angel of death would pass over them. But the first thing that happened in that Exodus account is Moses and Aaron went in before Pharaoh and the staves, he threw down his staff and it turned into a snake, like a symbolic message to the, the serpent, the, the Nakash. Now speaking of threes, if we skip all the way backwards to the garden in Genesis 3, first place our serpent appears, and also where we get three curses. One, put on the, the serpent, the Nakosh, the shining one. The second, on Adam and Eve, particularly on Adam, notice that the curse goes on not on Adam, but on the ground. So there's a correlation between what happens to the spiritual condition of man and what happens to the earth, the ground. But it reads this in Genesis 3, under the three curses, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, I bet he was upset about this, the wisest creature, the most arum, clever creature. What does that mean? 
Cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You are to crawl on your belly, and you will eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, between the serpent and the woman. One of the teachings of ancient Samaria, ancient Sumerian kings, was that secret knowledge from the, from the gods. And they were called the, the Mees, me, almost a prideful thing, the Mees. And one of the Mees is, well, not only witchcraft, magic, power, lies for deceit, falsehoods, pretending, acting, fear, terror, and lying all throughout government, but one of the large ones was enmity. This is one of the secret teachings of their gods, how you get ahead. You think about me, 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 me. And this is actually a real thing, me, the, the, the me, the holy me or the holy me's. I guess you could also pronounce it the me's or the mess, so it could be the holy mess. And I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, between your offspring, what does that mean? Your offspring, the serpent's offspring, perhaps in a physical and spiritual sense, it wants both, right? Between your offspring and hers, he, the offspring of the woman, the offspring of the woman, will crush your head and you, the serpent, will strike his heel. So we're almost looking at, just like in that garden with the two trees, two paths, and one of them has a whole lot of me, 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 me's. The secret knowledge at its core is all about me or one tree with a snake, but a snake that looks good to the eyes, got some Hollywood glitter on it. Appears to be good to make one wise. They thought they were wise, but they became as fools. Do you remember that? And the last one, ye shall become as gods. You are the gods. So on one hand, bear no expense. You can sacrifice your own subjects for your own me's. On the other hand, is a God that would lay down his life for his friends. You know, Abraham was, uh, was a pretty, he was a dusty, he was a pretty dusty sheep herder. But that dusty old sheep herder was called a friend of God. It says about Abraham, he trusted God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. And I asked the angel who went with me and showed me these hidden things concerning this one, this son of man, who he was, whence he was, and why he accompanied the head, the ancient of days. You know, it really is a lot of symbols. Genesis 3 and beyond. You know, on a larger scope, it's almost, it's almost like you're living in a test. Two trees, two paths. If you really think about it, it's almost like a virus in a computer program, something operating from some other dimension like phishing, like it sends out a bunch of emails that come right into the mind, bombards you with them in your spam box, your mental spam box. And then it just focuses on and knows which ones that hook you. And then it only sends those out. And by this mechanism, has control. So what is the serpent in the tree from Tablet 3 telling us and his goat friends? Though the planets are creations of God, the empires of Earth, beginning out there in ancient Samaria, in fact, where the Tower of Babel actually took its rise, following the flood. The empires of earth began worshiping them, the planets, as their demon gods. They worship the creation and not the creator. And in fact, all of the golden age of gods and all of these tangled mythologies that we're gonna try and untangle and unveil for you here are really the occult, beginning with the serpent. 
repackaging itself larger and larger and larger in every empire leading to this present day. Now, speaking of Romans, and they're the last of your six major empires. You've had six major empires since the flood. The Assyrians, the Assyrians packaged in with the Sumerians, that's what they both are. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then finally the Romans, which ultimately all of your major empires at the death of Jesus Christ would turn into massive religions. In fact, the Romans would become the Roman Catholic Church. But I find it only appropriate to begin with what Paul himself wrote to the Romans, who heavily held all of these beliefs that had become so emphasized over time that it started all the way back with a little seed of a snake in ancient Samaria that would become Babylon. Verse 21 of Romans 1. For although they knew God, they knew God. And we're going to find that even in these ancient documents, that the people that authored these, they knew God, but they flipped the truth upside down. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Now when think about occult symbols, many people may think about this symbol here, the, the ion. The ion is, it's a duality. It's a symbol that's a duality. Let me tell you something about all symbols, even the snake or the goat. The devil doesn't own anything here. Not one thing. He's only got a short-term lease, and there are very few things, like this symbol, that he even can use. The ion is, however, it's one that he can. It is a duality. And let me tell you what I mean by that. The ion can be the light of God. From Genesis 1, 3, 1, 3. Or it can be the ion Ra. The ion Ra, what is that name? Sound Egyptian to you? From Matthew 6, 22. 6, the number of man, and 22, the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The eye, the eye, is the lamp unto the body. Therefore, if thine eye be single, like the iron, then thy whole body shall be full of light. However, if the light within you, within any of us, be darkness, then how great is that darkness. Now the ion, or the symbol of the one eye peering out, particularly the left eye peering forth, can be a foreshadowing or a looking towards of the, of the Antichrist, the one-eyed, the Antichrist. Can also be the one eye from, in the book of Yasher, from Nimrod's dream. He keeps having an Enzu bird pluck out his eye as if a foreshadowing that he is a model of the coming Antichrist, Nimrod would be. But what the ion is in a larger scope, well, it's the number 70. It's number 70. Now, the ion is one of only eight in Hebrew of what are called crowned letters, special crowned letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And the Shen is also one of those special crowned letters. In part one of this series, Garments from the Garden of God, we talked about the iron going from light to dim or darkness with the use of our serpent. And I think our, our garments will end up popping up again in all of this. You know with garments and and ephods, it was for the high priests of Israel. It has 12 stones on it. We're going to look at that. And you've got this snake out there trying to take as many pieces as it can. And of course, you're the pawn on the board. And boy, it goes bad eternally. That's a word bigger than you or I can understand. If he takes your piece or dims your little light. It sort of makes me think of the, the, the modern science crowd or the top guys of the universe. Here's their symbol back here. Gosh, Tom, look here at these, uh, these particles here. It's almost like we're, uh, we're living in us a, uh, 
a big video game. <laughs> we went from monkeys to video games. Good work, guys. There might be a bigger umbrella of a picture there, but I like where you're going with that. So if you're in a, a game, a video game, if you think you might be in a game, you think it might be a good idea to find out the, uh, the rules of the game. And another thing about being in a game, in this particular situation, you actually didn't choose the game or the rules of the game. But you are, in fact, on the board on the game. That would be true, right? Anyhow, there are eight crown symbols. Actually, the tet right back here on the screen is also one of them. Ayin is the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Of course, six and one makes seven. Seven is how many days you have in your week, in your creation week. You got a serpent trying to take over your creation week, trying to put in a video game, trying to take over territory, property. The other guy's pieces change them from light to dark, correct? The ayin is the number 70. I would remind everybody that God told those fallen angels, you thought you knew secrets. Little did you know you only knew the worthless ones. More than that, darkness is only possible in places where light is not. And that's a very powerful number. 70 in Hebrew means judgment sacrifice also mean light or dark and that's why I would really plead with all you guys on the cover of magazines and you're just desperate to do that um, if you're gonna plead for something plead for mercy and grace and continue to prosper for even the work that you're doing um, don't, don't plead for uh, I assure you most of you you really don't you want to hold judgment as long as possible particularly with what many of you do in Enoch 10:11. It's from the book of Enoch. And the Lord said unto Michael, Go and bind Semyaza. That was the leader. Him and Azazel, the goat. The goat. We're going to make it full circle to the goat. Go and bind Semyaza and his fallen angels. That would be the 200 angels that fell at Mount Hermon. And bind them fast for 70 generations. How long is a generation? If it were 100 years, that would be 7,000 years, wouldn't it? If it were 70 years, it would be, what, 4,900 years or something close to that? Bind them for 70 generations. Any way that you might interpret that, it would be close. So perhaps with your one eye, you're looking forward to a time where those things would be free. Now, if we're talking about a serpent at the top of things, surely we all know the parable of the lady that took the serpent in from the snow. Right? If we're doing our one-eye thing, they took the serpent in from the snow and she held it and she coddled it and she pet it and she thought, oh, what a beautiful snake. It'll love me when it gets back to health. And it bit her. And she said, why did you bite me? And you're venomous. You're very venomous. Now I lay dying. And the snake says, lady, you, uh, you knew I was a snake. Don't beg for judgment, particularly if you don't know what it means. Bind them fast for 70 generations. So 70 is a number that operates often as a time clock. That's how long that the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity. That's in the book of Daniel. 70 weeks of seven are declared upon your people. Bind them for 70 generations until the day of the last judgment. Now, but if I come over here through the lineage of Shem in Genesis 11, now 70 is also affiliated with Israel and the Hebrews quite a lot. When the Hebrews, when the Israelites went into Egypt, went into Egypt, there were 70 of them. They entered a family and they left a nation. Now, Egypt is where all the idols are, correct? Now, through the lineage of Shem, if I come down to Genesis 11, well, Terah, Terah is the father of Abraham. And look what Terah was. Terah was the head idol maker for Nimrod. That's who he was. And you always notice the root of something in the text. Here is the root of Israel. Well, it's in the lineage of Shem. In fact, Abraham's father, Terah, was the head idol maker for Nimrod. And I find that symbolism fascinating and this is a story even on these stones both the occult 
and the Lord and the old snake, here, get your tongue on this side, who likes to masquerade and copy things. Is that true? Yep. I told you. The occult has its symbolism and God has his symbolism. But just like Abraham's father was actually the head idol maker for Nimrod, the largest wicked empire on earth, in your biblical text, Israel, that would come through this lineage, is in fact called Babylon more often than Babylon, the literal, actual Babylon, where Marduk was and worshipped, was called Babylon. Now, if we're dealing with a serpent, which indeed we are, a Tiamat, taking its shape or her shape in this modern age, even with its ministers like Golga, well, then she should have her temples and be doing everything she can that the mother goddess serpent can to taint the places of righteousness. Here behind me, of course, is the Vatican Cathedral. And I make no judgment, but it does sort of look like a giant serpent, as good of Tiamat as could be found. Abraham, I would state, was born when his father, Terah, the head idol maker for Nimrod, was 70 years old. So that number, the iron, is in fact a powerful symbol for the Lord. In fact, the Lord wants it highlighted. But I would ask this, even of the Catholic Church. You know, when Abraham, in the book of Yasher, he had to make a very heavy choice. God said, Abraham trusted God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. He had to make a choice, just like the two trees light and dark. And Nimrod had him pulled in to his inner lair with all of his dark priests and his witchy people. And Abram was thrown to the floor. And his father, Terah, the, the weasel, his father, Terah, was an embarrassment of a man, is what he was. And Nimrod had Abram brought before him. And he said, uh, so I hear you've destroyed the idols, your father's idols, all of the idols, the grand idols of the gods of Babylon. And then you tell this story to me. Do you not understand the power? Look around you, Abram. Do you not understand the power of the flames, the fire, the very heart of power before which you now stand? And yet you tell me this story, son of the idol maker. How foolish do you think I am? This is what Nimrod asked Abraham. And Abram looked up from the floor and he said, I don't know. How foolish are you, my king? That must have probably stunned Nimrod. And Abram looked over at him and he said, you tell me what I've just told you is foolish. Yet you teach the men of all earth that these gods made of wood and stone are the gods that created the heavens and the earth. You're doing the very same things that the men did before the flood, which caused the God of the universe to destroy the world. So respectfully, my king, how foolish are you? And this dearly perplexed Nimrod, I'll tell you, I can't wait to get to those parts in this series where we talk about Nimrod and Abraham and all of it. But I'll tell you, even if you're the Catholic Church, even as Abraham had to dust the old idol maker off of himself, let me ask you this one question. Would Abraham, the father of the lineage that would lead through Israel, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, father of faith in your entire Bible, would Abraham, have a cathedral shaped like a snake? I tell you this, 
If we're playing a video game, I call that a point for the serpent. Well, whatever the case, beneath the old tongue down here, perhaps where the Nikosh, the serpent, the Tiamat, wishes to most loudly speak, we find the Pope, that's him right down here, next to, I guess that's his friend, and above them the God coming forth from chaos. And the first thing I thought, actually, when I saw this statue here was, well, I thought immediately, of the, the Inky, look how similar they are, the Inky coming forth from his portal of abyss coming all the way in. In fact, this seed of the gods right here is not dissimilar to our monkey religion, our modern science. There's the gods and then there's the rest of you, riffraff you monkeys. Indeed, order from chaos. In the beginning there was nothing and then it exploded. If you believe that part of it, you believe anything. Our snake has indeed made it a long ways from that garden and taken a lot of pieces on the board. This comes from the first tablet, of one of the seven little tablets of the Enuma Elish. When in the height of heavens was not named and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name and the primeval Abzu, that means the abyss. Abzu means abyss. What they're stating is order arose from chaos. Let me continue. The abyss begat them, the heavens and the earth. Abyss begat heavens and the earth. And chaos, Tiamat, Tiamat is the serpent. So this story on these stones begins with the snake. And Tiamat was the mother, the mother goddess of them both. This is the Sumerians' history of the world on the most, doesn't just talk about the flood, but on their most prized documents. The god to them, on top of the gods, is the snake. Tiamat is the mother goddess. She created the heavens and the earth from chaos. She then creates the gods, the serpent gods and the demons, her sons. Now in Genesis 3, we have our, we have our snake, our Nakash. And the word Nakash is actually in three parts. As a noun, it means serpent. That's why it's translated as snake. As a verb, it means to be divine. And as an adjective, it means the shining one. So this is a luminous, serpentine, shining serpent. An angelic being, wise yet evil. Tiamat, the snake, spawned monster serpent, sharp of tooth and merciless of fang. With poison instead of blood, she filled their bodies. Fierce monster vipers, she clothed them with terror. With splendor, she has joy doing this, with splendor, she, the snake, decked them. She made them lofty of stature, they were giant. She set up the vipers and the dragons and the monsters. Now, in Genesis 3, we start with a choice between two trees in the garden. On one hand, the tree of life, and on the other hand, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But I would argue that this isn't a story about right or left. This is a story about up or down. Paul writes to the Corinthians that even the devil himself, that old snake, masquerades as an angel of light. Is that true? Do you masquerade? You like wearing masks, pretending things you're not? You masquerade as an angel of light? Yes. Told you. So this on the screen behind me is the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem in Israel. And it's kept up by, by the Catholics, by the Catholic Church. And I can tell you, we've got family members that are Catholic and they're honestly, they're some of the nicest people on it, some of the most generous as well. And but the Catholic Church, I will state this, that I've been very appreciative of the fact that they have tried to keep artifacts um, that go all the way back to the time of Jesus. In this case, probable spot of the birth of Jesus, where the, was it three sets of wise men, three, gold, frankincense, and myrrh were the three gifts that they brought for Jesus. And they were following a, a star. Well, it's a strange star. But the truth is, and generally in places of power, 
and all people, you're going to find paganism, even at people's best. And it generally starts with the, thing, the very thing that God says he actually hates most, pride, the me's, the secret knowledge from the gods. Now, what I found funny about the me's, the me, 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 me's, is, well, the me's largely come off of Inky and the World Order. Now, a lot of people throw around this try, I guess it would be Inky and the New World Order, but so just realize the gravity of that. That's an actual tablet, Inky's World, Inky's New World Order, going all the way back to the days of the Sumerians and Nimrod. He's actually done it at least one, two, three, four, five, six, six times. So I guess he's had a little bit of practice at this. A lot of people throw this term New World Order around. I, I, I really, I don't think that's an appropriate term. If anything, it's the Old World Order, and I don't even know if you could state that. This isn't Inky's first rodeo. Actually, Inky's argument for you to do every single thing that somehow seems a little bit off with your heart. His argument for doing that is always pretty much the same, almost like a computer virus would do. It's attractive to the eyes. It's good to make you wise, man. And you don't need God. You already are a God. Inky's sort of, you know, he's been doing this a long time. And his me's include that the common man, that would be you and me, we're basically grunts in the, in the documents, are going to be taught blacksmith, leatherworking, brickworking. Get down there. Build it, you monkeys. Move those rocks quicker. Fan me more. Sitting on top of the temple, it's almost like Inky views mankind, even the pharaohs that he puts in charge or the grand kings of Babylon he views them like network resources right you got to pay them a little bit for a while but spiritually bankrupt them and turn everybody else into slaves that's Inky's formula but these were all I assure you all of them Ham, Cush, Nimrod and Mardan they were all me 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 people now speaking of two paths or two trees now whereas we're going to be following two lineages, and it's the one that comes through Ham, through Cush, through Nimrod, that's going to ultimately lead to Marduk, who is the main character in our Enuma Elish. And Marduk, seen right here, one of the main gods that was worshipped later in Babylon, we can safely assume, we can fairly safely assume, is the deified son of Nimrod, being referenced in the book of Yasher as Mardan are opening a cult, unholy trinity, almost like an arrow pointing downwards. Marduk is, in the occult, the planet Jupiter, with the big eye on the planet Jupiter right there. In fact, in the Sumerian Mullah pen 1, it states one big wandering star. The planets were wandering stars in the ancient world. One big wandering star is Marduk. There he is, the planet Jupiter. Nibiru, Nibiru, this is Nibiru popping up in the text. Nibiru, so Nibiru is Jupiter in the ancient text, at least the Sumerians. The wandering star, Jupiter. That's one of many examples. So in your ancient past, is not just in my view, it's not just people making stuff up. A lot of it is ancestor worship. And they would deify their ancestors. They would worship, pray to, and deify their ancestors. But even so, we're really not talking as much about bloodlines as we are talking about two different spiritual paths. In fact, if we were to take the lineage of Shem, the son that Noah put the highest crown of blessing on the symbol, Symbol of the, as I come down through the 22 letters of the, this is pre-Canaanite Hebrew behind me, all the way down to the 21st, the second to the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Symbol of the Shin right there, the hidden name for God. And the Shin looks like a crown of a king because it is a crown of a king. It also represents the consuming fire, the teeth of God himself. It is the number 300, just like three parts to, three parts to God, three parts to the, the masqueraders, the lineage down here from Ham, Cush, going through Nimrod, three parts to the mask wearing guys, behind which is the luminous serpent that comes in different forms but three sons of Noah, all with their strengths and weaknesses. But the symbol of the Shen 
the crown of a king right there, 300, is the letter that starts the name Shem. In Hebrew, we read from right to left. The Shen and the Mem makes the word Shem. The Shem means name, but more precisely, the hidden name for God. So not only do we have the start of the crown for the king, the hidden name of God, but we also have the Mem, which is symbolized, and by the way, I've combined modern Hebrew with ancient Hebrew in this particular spelling of the word Shem. The Mem from pre-Canaanite Hebrew represents the waters, almost like we're looking at the flood right there. Just like it rained 40 days and 40 nights, the Mem is the number 40. More than this, Mem means a flowing of secret knowledge, secret Torah, secret wisdom, all combined in the name Shem. Jesus actually talked when he was talking to the Pharisees. Not only was he bedazzling their minds, but he was largely talking in parables. He was giving them smaller examples of larger scale things, often things from another place. Accordingly, Enoch referred to his life in this place as a parable. I took up my parable. He viewed his life here as a little tiny version of something from a larger place. Always notice the details. But dealing with our 22 letter alphabet as I come down to my letter of the Shin, the crown of a king or the hidden name for God, well, the very next letter or the last letter right here as I move from the Shin. Now watch my hands, I've got nothing on my sleeves. Speaking of Jesus, the letter right after that crown of a king. Well, gee, George, is that a cross? And that last letter means sign or mark. Now, speaking of mysteries and secrets, Shem, one of the three sons, just like the Shen, the crown of a king, has three points on it. Moving through those three sons, through the Mem, or the flood, which reigned for 40 days and 40 nights, just as Jesus, before his ministry began, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, 40, the Mem wiggles us through our Exodus story where the Hebrews, the Israelites, when they were in Egypt, they were actually up here in the land of Goshen, also called Avoris. They would take a three-day journey. Now, they came from the lineage of Shem, the crown of the king, taking their three-day journey through the Red Sea, or I guess the waters of the Mem, and ultimately make it from Avaris through this crossing point at the Red Sea, which point they would enter the wilderness, where they, of course, were for 40 years. Now, many say that God doesn't use numbers in mathematics, but yet this crossing right here takes us directly into the book of Numbers. In fact, Numbers 2, we read about this camp in the wilderness, at the heart of which would be the tabernacle, where the fire of God would not only come down from Mount Sinai, but in the heart of the, the Levite priests, the heart of the tabernacle. But God had very specific instructions. Almost looks like you're reading data when you read those pages in Numbers. Very specific instructions on how he wanted the Israelite, the Hebrew camp, structured. So if we take that nearly dimensional seeming data and begin to draw out what that camp actually looked like, it begins to make the shape of a giant cross with the tribes. Why God wanted them numbered is so you would know the links with the tribe of Judah down there at the bottom of that cross. And mind you, the instructions God gave on this camp are, are actually quite tedious. So the camps can only be so wide and each tribe of Israel is to go in certain spots. So it can only be so wide and it can only go, for example, due north, due south and be so wide. So it can go really long, but it can only be so wide. 
And that's how you know when you begin drawing this thing out, this camp, the exact dimensions given to you of this camp. I mean, if you just read it as text, it's going to come off as a tedious, difficult read. But the moment you start, no detail in the Bible is trite. Whether it be the weight of a board on the boat, the length of the boat, or the exact instructions of the Hebrew camp. Bottom line, it, this was a moving cross on the desert floor with the mathematics or the numbers of each of the 12 tribes. And at the very heart of that, of that cross were the priests, the Levite priests. Now, does that camp look an awful lot like the symbol of the Tov, meaning sign or mark? The camp of Israel was, in fact, a, it's a giant moving cross, which means sign or mark. That's what it was on the, <laughs> on the wilderness floor. And in the heart of the camp, that's where the tabernacle was. That's where the fire of God would come down, would be there in the heart of the camp where the Levite priests were. Now, the Israelites, and I find this fascinating, when they saw clouds, just like when you see clouds, you might see clouds in your life, they were not to move. It was only when they saw fire, when they saw fire, that they knew now it's time to go. And the high priest, beginning with Aaron, beginning with Aaron, would wear the high priest ephod. This is the ephod over here. Actually, the ephod is an entire set of garments that the that the high priest would wear. Now, these are not the garments from the uh, from the garden passed down through Adam and Eve and through Noah and stolen by Ham. But what they are is they are representative of a priestly covering, a priestly covering. And the actual ephod was worn over the chest. In fact, every element of the camp, the tabernacle, right down to the priestly ephod is pointing, it's pointing towards the Mashiach, it's pointing towards Jesus. But it had 12 precious stones on it, and each stone represented a tribe of Israel that the priest would wear over the heart while he was going in for prayer before God. He's wearing the tribes of Israel over his, over his heart. And 12, 12 is how many months that you have in the year. 12 is how many disciples that Jesus had. 12 is how many sons of Jacob there were whose name would be changed to Israel. 12 is how many tribes of Israel that there were. 12 is a number of perfection. It's also a number of godly government and authority. And you have three levels to the tabernacle. You have the outer court where the people could come in and they could pray. You have the inner court. And then you had the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, there were three holy objects. This was the setup that God had. One, you had the Ten Commandments. The first holy item of the three, three. The yod is the ten. That represents God himself. There were ten commandments. Ten. It's a universal whole number. The second item in the Ark of the Covenant was the staff of Aaron's staff. This is the same staff he would throw down before the magicians of Pharaoh, which turned into a serpent and ate their serpents when the magicians of Pharaoh did the same. But it's also the staff, Aaron's staff, which budded. It was buried under the ground. And then when it was pulled back up, it had budded, it had borne fruit. The staff represents Jesus Christ. That was in the Ark of the Covenant. The third item is the holy manna. This is an ancient Israeli jar right here. It said the manna was put in an ancient jar. This is a menorah, the jar of heavenly manna. This represents they said that it tasted like honey, this manna that would fall from the sky, heavenly manna. This represents the kingdom of God to come. It almost is like a video game, isn't it? With all these symbolic items. These are the three dispensations represented in that box. And the high priest would go in once a year and he would sprinkle the blood, sprinkle the blood of atonement on the mercy seat 
between the two angels, the blood of atonement. And he would do this on Passover. So the high priest would take the blood of the Passover lamb, the first Passover was in Egypt, on the last plague of Egypt. He would take the blood, the Passover lamb, and he would sprinkle it between, on the mercy seat, between the two angels. For the, with all of the tribes of Israel on his ephod, on his garment, and he would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on there for atonement for the sins of Israel. Now, speaking of 12, were these 12 precious stones on the ephod representing the tribes of Israel? 12, if I come backwards to Exodus 12, Exodus chapter 12, this would be the last plague of Egypt. There were 10 plagues. Each plague of Egypt represented a god of Egypt. For example, the, god, the frogs. The frogs are the god happy from Egypt. That's actually where you get the word happy. But all of the plagues represented a god of Egypt. All ten of them. All ten of them. Beginning with the snake. Beginning with a message to the snake. But the last god of Egypt, see Pharaoh means god king. Means god king. So Pharaoh is the last god of Egypt. So the first god being talked to is the serpent. Message to the serpent. But the last god would be Pharaoh, god king of all earth. And the firstborn son of Pharaoh, the next god king, the son of God to Egypt. And it's always the firstborn son who gets the blessing, gets the blessing, the kingship. That's the next God king of Egypt. That is the son of God in Egypt. And it states this, beginning in passage 5, the number of grace. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this month, the month of Nisan, the month of Nisan, was Nisan 17th, if you remember, that the ark landed, that the Red Sea parted, and that Jesus came out of the tomb after three days. So the first Passover is, wait a second, this month, that's Nisan, Nisan 14th. This month will be the very first month of the year for you. Tell Israel, each man must take a lamb, the Passover lamb, like they would sprinkle on the Ark of the Covenant for the atonement of sins. Take care of it until the 14th day of the month. Nisan 14. That's three days before the tomb opened. Nisan 17, three days. Take care of it, the lamb, the Passover lamb, until the 14th day of this month. Passage 6, the number of men. At dusk, all of the people of Israel must slaughter their Passover lamb. And they must take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of their door frames and houses. Wait a second, what's the next word? It shall be a sign. A sign. Sign. Well, the Tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, is the only letter that means mark or sign. It shall be a sign. I assure you they were following this to the letter. But those Passover lambs on that night, they were painting in the lamb's blood crosses on their doorposts. It is the Lord's Passover. Wait a second, and this is exactly three days before they would be at the Red Sea and the waters would open and the Israelites would pass through death with the Pharaoh's army right on their tail. Now, at the beginning of the Exodus account, when Pharaoh is laughing, I'm listening, you have audience. 
with Pharaoh, God King of all earth. So tell me, Moses and Aaron, what does the God of the slaves have to say to Pharaoh? And even from the beginning of the story, wasn't Moses stating we're to take a three-day journey and then there's going to be a very large sacrifice? And Pharaoh laughs at them in the very heart of his dark lair and says, so tell me, speakers for the slaves, the God of the slaves, what does your God, tell me, entertain me, what does your God intend to sacrifice after this three-day journey? And Moses replied, I, and he was honest, I, I don't know, Pharaoh. He only said that he would provide the sacrifice. Pharaoh must have remembered those words when he stood right here after three days and the waters were opened saying, come on, Pharaoh, come on in. And oh, I assure you, Pharaoh, he remembered when he stood right there. He was too far in to turn back. And the whole time when Moses repeatedly in the Exodus account is stating, we are gonna take a three day journey. See, Pharaoh didn't know, probably until that very moment, that the we included him too. We are gonna take a three day journey, Pharaoh. Then, yeah, there's just a small detail. There's gonna be a really big sacrifice. And something tells me the Pharaoh probably wasn't laughing anymore that day. And I'm telling you guys, I'm just, I'm just getting warmed up here. This goes on, Exodus 12, 12, that's 24. It's a number of heavenly authority. 12, just like the tribes of Israel, verse 12. And on that same night, I, God, will go throughout Egypt and kill every firstborn male, human and animal. I will severely punish all the gods of Egypt. It's being specific. Because I am the Lord. But the blood on your houses will be a sign, a tov, a mark for your protection. 29, and at midnight, the Lord killed every firstborn male in Egypt, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who ruled the land from his throne to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the cage. And there was a cry in Egypt. The pure papyrus indicates that at that stroke of midnight, this wasn't a calm and subtle thing. It says they were bashed against the walls of Egypt, as if by invisible hands, that dark first Passover night. And you have to bear in mind that by this point, Moses is not only talking to Pharaoh, and the priests of Pharaoh are now, they're nervous of Moses and Aaron far before this last one. And even the people of Egypt, Moses and Aaron had gone even to the Egyptians, some of who had painted the blood of lambs on their doors. And the angel of death passed over even them. Some of the Egyptians who are now listening. And even Moses would plead with the people of Egypt, the Pharaoh in there, he just, he won't listen. And nine times, nine times, God has undone this. And it's worse every time I plea with you. Please, Pharaoh, don't do this. I can't undo. God won't undo the last one, Pharaoh. Please, just for your own sake and your own people, will you let them go? And Pharaoh would not. So everyone knew his invisible hands grabbed on that last one, that 10th one. 
that this was not the God of the Hebrews, but the God of Pharaoh and Pharaoh himself. If you won't listen, maybe you'll feel. This was Pharaoh that did this to his own people and everybody knew it at that point. So when Pharaoh comes in and says, this is the only plague that did not get undone. 10 is the number of completion. 10, nine times. Pharaoh, please Moses, would you go and do the frogs and the flies and the this and the that? And Moses had pleaded with him, don't, just, just let them do it, just let them go, Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart kept being hardened. And every time, God would undo it until that last one, until the very last one. And with his dead firstborn son in his hands, Pharaoh's, the next God king, the next, the literal son of God to Egypt in his hands. Pharaoh says on that Nisan 14th, the same day that Jesus would be crucified on the cross, would you raise my son from the dead? And Moses says goodbye, Pharaoh. There would be no son of God raised that Passover. And in three days from that Passover, Pharaoh would be standing there on the edge of the Red Sea, watching the Hebrews dance and sing with all the gold of Egypt their way to the other side, while the waters, as if taunting Pharaoh, stood parted and said, bring your army and come on in. I want to thank all of you for watching. This has been part two of the Genesis series by God in a nutshell. There's an extended version of this film, very extended, over for partners in the streaming section at GodInANutshell.com. And I also want to thank every single one of you that have gotten copies of the, the God in a Nutshell set of, set of books. They are absolutely beautiful on any coffee table and they're just a lot of fun and they're fully illustrated. God bless every single one of you. God bless every last one of you. Come over and stream the elongated section of this. Also, Tablets of Destiny is up over there and I'm working on, I've got two more of them that are nearly done, guys. And I know I'm moving a little slower than I'd anticipated, but I, I would rather them be good films than be fast films. They'll all be good. Come over to GodInTheNutshell.com. God bless every last one of you and your families on the other side of the screen.